Well, welcome to E2 Church. My name is Pastor Jared. I'm the lead pastor here, and I am so glad that you're joining us on a very, very special Sunday. It's Giving Sunday at E2, and uh, we're gonna have some really, really special moment at the end of the service. I know worship felt a little shorter today. That's because we're gonna be worshiping after the sermon today. And so, uh, but I wanna encourage you, whether you're here for the first time or you call E2 Church your home, uh, in these next few moments to lean in with faith. Uh, I gotta be honest with you, my voice is struggling a little bit today, so this is as loud as I can get. So I need you to talk back to me today to help me preach this message, okay? I also, I wanna welcome all of those who are joining us online, our E2 Online family. We wanna welcome you, thank you for tuning in. We believe that God has a word for you as well, wherever you are, and I wanna encourage you, if you can make it at some point, Come and join us here in the room. Uh, we'd love to have you on a weekend experience here at E2 Church. Are y'all ready for the word today? Uh, we've been in this series titled Functional Faith. We've talked about the different functions of faith, that faith is a step even when you can't see it. We've talked about faith as a sacrifice, bringing something to God. We talked about the submission of faith to the authority of God. Well, today, I wanna talk about the stretch of faith. Somebody say, it's a stretch. First Kings chapter 17, let me read it to you, starting in verse seven. The story says this, sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the prophet, and it said, go at once to Zarephathim, the region of Sidon, and stay there. I have directed a widow to supply you with food. Verse 10, so he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, would you bring me a little water in a jar so that I might have a drink? As she was going to get it, he stopped her. And he said, you know what? While you're at it, would you bring me please a piece of bread? Somebody say, it's a stretch. I believe that sometimes God places a call on your life and it feels a little bit bigger than you're capable of accomplishing. Somebody say, it's a stretch. But I believe this, when you stretch your faith, God will always show up. And I'm believing that here today, that as we stretch our faith as a church, as a ministry, God is gonna show up in supernatural ways. So here's what I want you to do. On your way to your seat, high five five people, tell them it's a stretch. Go ahead and high five five people, tell them it's a stretch, it's a stretch. It's a stretch. Can you believe that it is already holiday season? Is it? I feel like this year went, it flew by. Like we're already at 2025. Holiday season is here. Uh, it's Thanksgiving this week. Anybody uh, getting together with family, Thanksgiving stuff? We always get together with Trin's family, her massive Vietnamese family, uh, does a big Thanksgiving meal. I bring the candy yams because that's my contribution. Uh, they didn't even know about yams until I showed up. I said, yo, this is what we do. And, uh, and then we're going, in a few weeks, we're going to South Carolina to be with my family because my brother just had his second baby. And so we're gonna celebrate with them and do kind of an early Christmas. Um, we, we don't have a lot of like Christmas traditions in my family. We're kind of like a boring, small white family. And uh, we do have one tradition during Christmas. Uh, we do white elephant. Y'all, y'all remember white elephant? It's where you kind of like bring your gifts that you got last year that you didn't like, you wrap them up and you offer them to other people. And, uh, and so this is what we do uh, for our family. We do the white elephant. I, I feel like I have a little bit of PTSD with white elephant though, because in white elephant, the way that it works is that, you know, there's all these gifts in the center. You go and grab one when your number is picked. And when you grab the gift, it's usually something like terrible. It's like something, you know, that you don't want and you're going to throw in the trash or re-gift for next year's white elephant. Um, but sometimes, it's a really good gift. Like somebody splurged a little bit, you know, they went beyond the spending limit or it's like something you really wanted and really like enjoy. But the problem is, is in White Elephant, you can't let people know you like the gift. You can't hardly let them know that it's a good gift at all because if they know that it's a good gift, 
they could steal that gift. So you have to play like these mind games with people, like pretend, like, ah, oh, it's like whatever, I don't even like care, you know, I don't even like that. And because if they see it, they could steal it. And so and I'm a terrible liar. Like I can't bluff, I do not play poker, I get flushed red. Like if, if I'm not telling the truth, you know it. And so I, I hate this part of the game. And I was thinking about that this week because I'm mentally having to prepare for White Elephant when we go to be with my family. Thinking about that process and thinking about how sometimes it feels like life is a little bit like that with God. Like, have you ever felt like you got a blessing in your life? You really, you've been praying for it. You know, God gave you that thing. Or maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's a new job. Or, you know, maybe it's just a physical item. Whatever it is, you, you really like it a lot. But you don't want to show God that you like it too much. Because you're afraid that if he sees that you like it too much, he might ask for it back. I mean, if you grew up in church, you knew these types of things with God. Like, we used to say, you know, never tell God never. Because if you tell him never, that's exactly what he's going to tell you to do, right? We have these ideas of God, and, and some of it's, you know, not true, but a lot of it is rooted in the reality that, you know, we know how God works, and God is God, and he doesn't want anything else to take the place of God in our lives. And so sometimes it can feel a little bit like when we experience something great or we have something that we really enjoy, that it's inevitable that God is going to ask for it. And, and, and this can cause fear and, and frustration, and I think sometimes can create the wrong perspective of who God is in our lives, where we begin to believe that God doesn't want us to enjoy our lives or anything good he wants to take away. Can I just tell you the truth about God? Everything good in your life has come from God. Every blessing, every moment of prosperity, every mountain high, come on, every victory. The Bible says every good and perfect gift comes from God. And God is not a bad father where he gives you good gifts and he just tries to take it back because he doesn't love you or he doesn't want you to enjoy it. The only time God ever asks for something from you is because he has something better, come on now, that he has intended for you. You may not see it right now. Come on, you, you, you're holding on to that thing, but, but, but God has something greater that he wants to hand over to you. The problem is, is that we don't trust in his goodness that he's a really good father that has good gifts for his kids. The Bible says this, if you being good parents, come on, on Christmas, give your kids good gifts, how much more will your heavenly father give you good things in your life? God will bless you with what you need. And so the truth is, is that when God asks for something from you, it's not because he needs it. God doesn't need what you have. You need what he has. God doesn't need your money. He doesn't need your time. He doesn't need your talent. He can accomplish his purpose all by himself. The reason why he asks for things from us is because he wants to involve you and I. And how good is God that he would involve you and I in his great plan and purpose? Come on, we mess it up a lot. Come on, I know, I know that, that, that at some point in your life, you have not been the greatest representation of Jesus Christ when somebody cuts you off on 99. Come on, like you, you, we, we, we mess it up all the time and yet God still asks for us to be involved in this great plan and purpose. God doesn't need what you have, but you need what he has. Right. And the truth is, is that in our lives, the only way that we can receive from him what he has for us is that we're willing to hand over what we have and what we're holding on to. You can't receive something from God while you're still holding on to what you've got. God will ask you for an exchange. Give me what you have so I can give you what you need. And we see that concept in this story. In 1 Kings 17, let me give you a little bit of context to the story of Elijah and the widow. There is a nationwide drought that has hit the land. In fact, Elijah is the reason for the drought because at the time, the king was an ungodly and wicked man. And because of his wickedness, his rebellion against God, the prophet says, if you're not going to walk in obedience to God, God is going to cause judgment on the land and he's going to cause a drought. Now, you're not only gonna suffer, everybody else is going to suffer because leadership matters. Things go downstream. And so because of this ungodly and wicked king. Now the entire land is in a drought. And because of the drought, it has caused a famine. Now, 
Elijah is walking through the famine, and in this season of his life, God has led him to a place where there is a running water brook, and there is ravens that are feeding him, and God is supernaturally supplying Elijah in the midst of a really bad economy. That's good news for somebody, that even when the rest of the world is struggling, God can provide for your house and bless you and supply you from supernatural means, and yet all of a sudden, God dries up the brook and says, I've got something else for you. This is where you and I freak out because we've been so used to this one stream of income. Come on, this one stream of career and job and purpose. And then all of a sudden, overnight, it's like things change. And you get freaked out and change and transition because you don't like change because you like to be in control. Can I tell you, God is your provider. And if he provided you from the brook, he will provide from you somewhere else. God may dry up one stream to get you to another. And this is what God does. He tells Elijah, I'm going to provide for you in a new supernatural way. It's going to be through a widow. You're going to meet her. She's going to give you a glass of water and she's going to bake you a cake. He says, all right, I'm ready. So Elijah goes out and we pick up in the story in verse 10. says, he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, would you bring me a little water in a jar so I might have a drink. This woman is just minding her own business. If she's like me, she's introverted and trying to not have conversations with people she doesn't know. A stranger stays a stranger. And she is just trying to get her water and get out of there. There's not a lot of water. Remember, there's a nationwide drought. And so she is getting what she needs to survive for her and her son. And yet this prophet, this man of God, comes up taking an offering. He says, hey, oh, can you give me a glass of water? Get your own glass of water. We're all out here in the same boat trying to survive. But this woman, she's a good godly woman. And she, the Bible says she goes over to get the water. Because when she hears the prophet speak, she's not going to ask questions. She's just going to do it. And I love this because it means that, you know, she's got a sense of character that many, many of us don't have. Because we would have snapped back or clapped back the moment that somebody asked us for a drink of water in the midst of a nationwide drought. Do you not know my circumstance? Do you not know what I'm going through? Look at this. To add insult to injury, as she is going to get it, so she obeys the word, and then he says, hey, you know what? While you're at it, bring me a piece of bread. Bruh. (laughs) Like, That's crazy to me. Like, put yourself in this situation right now. Nobody has water. Nobody has food. And this dude just shows up and says, you know, I don't really feel like getting my own water out of that well. Could you go get it for me? Oh, while you're at it, can you make me some bread? Because I'm kind of hungry too. Listen, if you were a prophet, you would know the pain I'm walking through. Look at what she says. I love love her response, verse, verse 12. She says, as surely as the Lord your God lives. Can you hear the attitude in her voice? She says, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. If you were such a prophet, you would know that, wouldn't you? Supposed to know the future and all. And yet you're asking me for something I don't have. You're asking me to give something that I desperately need. You're asking me to offer you something that I'm trying to offer up to my son, and it's going to be our last meal, and after we eat it, we're going to die because there's no food or water in the land? And I don't know about you, but I feel like in my life, when I'm surrounded by such challenge, pain, and difficulty, this can become my perspective. Where Because I'm walking through such a dark valley, I'm just trying to survive I begin to only see what I don't have, and I miss out on what I do have. When you are walking through pain, it really limits your perspective to only see what you don't have. You're asking me for bread, I don't got that. You're asking me for water, I don't got that. I only got a few ingredients, and all I've got, we're going to eat it, we're going to die, that's all I have. I, I, I can't help you right now. I can't be there for you right now. I can't talk to you right now. I'm going through my own stuff. I I can't counsel you right now. I'm going through my own stuff. 
I can't give to that homeless guy knocking on my window because I'm going through my own hardships. You know the gas prices right now? We, we get such tunnel vision when we're walking through our own trauma. And here's what happens. When you focus on what you don't have, you will always miss out on what you do have. Can I just give you some perspective for a second? You live in the richest nation in the world. I know you don't think you have a lot, but the little that you have is far more than the majority of human beings on the planet. And because you're walking through pain right now, here's what the enemy has done. You've fallen into his trap of getting you into self-protection mode. And when you're in self-protection survival mode, the last thing you think about is being generous towards other people. And I'm not just talking about your money. I'm talking about your time. Come on, you, you, you're, fi you, you're fine sitting on the phone with that person that's gonna talk for two hours straight when you're good. But when you're going through something, I ain't got time for you, man. I got my own stuff. I got my own pain. I can't listen to you. And, and this is what happens. When the enemy convinces you that your life is in jeopardy, the last thing you think about is generosity. Why? Because I'm in survival mode. I'm just trying to hold on to the little that I have. And I think that the reason why this is the enemy's strategy in our lives is because if he can get you into this place, he can get you to block the blessing that God wants to bring into your life. He's not blocking a blessing. You're blocking a blessing. Why? Because the way that God provides for you is that you follow the law of sowing and reaping. The Bible says, let me just read it to you so I'm not, you know, I'm not lying to you. Proverbs eleven twenty five 25 says, a generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 says, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Sowing and reaping are spiritual laws. God says you want to reap something, you have to sow it. So let's make it practical. In your marriage, you want love, care, compassion. You've got to sow love, care, and compassion. I always say this when we're counseling couples. Your spouse is like a garden. And the fruit that you reap from it is the seed that you've sown into it. Now, I know some of you, you're looking at me saying, Pastor, you don't know the soil that I'm sowing into. It's a spiritual law. When you sow, and sometimes you need a little fertilizer. Come on, sometimes you need to till up that ground. Sometimes you've got to put some loving, you got to kill them with kindness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you have to be willing to sow. But here's what the enemy does. He convinces you that because you need that thing, you can't give that thing. Well, I need affection. How am I supposed to give it out? Uh, well, I need words of affirmation. How could I give it out? Well, what you want to reap, you have to be willing to sow, even when it, you feel like it's the last thing that you've got. That's the place of sacrifice, right? Is that I give what I need. And that's a spiritual principle. You sow into the very thing that you're believing God to bless you with. So instead of competing with other people and comparing with them online, how about you sow into their business? Ooh, that's a hard one, right? Now you put your money where your mouth is. Instead of wishing that everybody would celebrate you and support you in your, your endeavors, why don't you comment on their posts and celebrate them? Why don't you call them up and celebrate their victories? When you sow, you shall reap. When you refresh others, you yourself shall be refreshed. It's a spiritual principle. Do you know why? Because it's not those people that bless you. It's God. And if he's got to go through them, he'll do it. If he's got to go around them, he'll do it. But when you sow, you're not sowing into them. You are sowing into the kingdom of God and trusting that he will provide. But when we've got survival mode, we, we can't see what we have. We only see what we don't have. And when you only see what you don't have, you can't offer what you do have. 
She says this, I don't have any bread. She's focused on what she doesn't have. You're asking me for bread. I don't have bread. I only have a few ingredients. I got a little jar of flour and a little jug of oil. This is all I got. I got a lot, just a few ingredients. I'm gonna eat these ingredients and I'm gonna die. And that's what you and I do. You and I never experience the overflow of what God intended in our lives because we eat the ingredients before we can even get there. So I got a problem. I have a lot of problems, but this is the most recent problem. I, uh, I have a sweet tooth. Chocolate is my thing. I like chocolate. And I try not to eat a lot of chocolate, uh, but there's, there's this bag of semi-sweet chocolate chips in our pantry that's, it's just an open bag. We use it whenever my wife makes banana bread or chocolate chip brownies. It's used for baking, but they're so small. And they're right there, right where my hand is. When I walk into the pantry, I just find myself going into the little bag and just, and there's just a few, you know? It's just a few with a few handfuls. And over time, eventually, I just keep eating these chocolate chips. I love them. It's my little snack. It's my, it's my little treat. And so the other day, Trin went into our freezer because whenever we don't eat the bananas that we buy, which is all the time, she throws them into the freezer because she's going to make banana bread. And so she finally pulls out the bananas out of the freezer. She says, I'm going to make banana bread. I said, babe, please, can you make it with the chocolate chips? She said, absolutely, baby, whatever you want. She goes into the pantry, pulls out the bag, and there's no chocolate chips left in this bag. So where did all the chocolate chips go? I ate the ingredients. And now I can't experience the banana bread that was intended because I ate the ingredients before we could even get there. And God gave me a picture of some of you in your lives right now that You've only got a little bit, and because you only got a little bit, and you're not willing to wait on God and submit and offer the ingredients that you have into the oven of obedience, you eat the ingredients before you can even get there. I don't have a lot. I just got a little, and you know, it's just day by day. I just, I just gonna, I'm just going to buy this thing now. I'm going to enjoy this thing now. Why? Because, because I only got a little bit. I, I just got a few ingredients, and I'm just... I don't want to offer what I have because it's just a little bit. I just want to enjoy the little bit that I have. And this is what this widow is saying is I, I don't have bread. I just have a few ingredients. And all we plan on doing is eating those ingredients and dying. I'm just going to survive for one more day. And, and then that's it. And I wanted to encourage you here today. Maybe you've been eating the ingredients instead of waiting on God to do something extraordinary in your life. Don't settle for fast food that can come from the flesh when God wants to serve you a feast that comes from the Spirit. It's gonna take faith. It's gonna be a stretch. It's gonna require some patience and going through the process, but, but I came to encourage you, don't eat your ingredients. Offer them to God. It may feel like a little bit in your hands, but a little in the hands of God is a lot. And it can go a long way. Come on, this is the God who multiplied the bread and the fish. This is the God who turned water into wine. This is the God who can make miracles out of nothing. But, but when it's in my hands, it's just ingredients. I got ingredients to a relationship, but it's not really the God relationship that he has for me. I have ingredients to a, a life of purpose and, and, and financial freedom, but, but, but I haven't fully submitted it to God and, and, and trusted him with everything, made him Lord over my finances and over my purpose and everything. No, no I'm, I'm just going to eat the ingredients. And, and, and at some point, this widow had to trust that God could do more in his hands than she could do in hers. Look at 1 Kings 17, 13, Elijah he brings her a word of comfort, and he says, don't be afraid. I know you're here today. You're afraid. I know it's a stretch, what you're about to offer God. I want you to know you don't have to be intimidated. Why? He says, go home and do as you've said, but first make a small loaf of bread for me, and then bring it to me and make something for yourself and your son. Now, when you read that at face value, he sounds kind of selfish, right? Like, make the bread. Don't eat the ingredients. Make a cake, but make sure you bring me the first slice. <laughs> and then feed your son and yourself. 
she only knew that she had enough for her and her son. There's not enough for him too. But he says, bring what you have to me first. Why? Elijah is a prophet, and the prophet represents God, the move of God, the house of God. And while we don't have prophets like the Old Testament prophets, this prophet represents God coming to us and asking for what we have. And here's what God says to you. I'm gonna feed your family. I'm gonna feed you beyond what you think you even have. But first, feed me. Now, did Elijah need this woman to feed him? I mean, he was a prophet. He could have asked God to do it any other way, but, but, but yet he asked this woman, feed me first, and then watch God feed your house. This is a principle. It's a spiritual principle of the first fruits, that whatever we have and whatever we receive, it comes from God as a gift. And because whatever we have and whatever we receive is a gift from God, I am going to honor God with the first fruits of that gift, meaning I am going to give the first and the best. I'm going to feed his house first. I'm going to bless his house first. And then as I bless his house, that blessing will flow into my house. Proverbs 3, 9 says this, honor the Lord with your wealth with the first fruits of all your crops. And here's what happens when you do. Then, somebody say then, your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. God does not make a requirement of you without a guarantee and a promise over you. He says, when you bring to me first what you have, I will bless the rest. And I know this is a year-end offering that we're doing, but really, it, it, it's almost like this is the way we're starting off the new year. That's why we write our word for 2025 on the top of that. It's because this is the way we say, God, I'm going to honor you before I even get there. I'm going to put you first in my life, in my family, in my marriage, in my relationships, in my career, in my finances. Why? Because you've been so good to me. And so instead of eating my ingredients, you know what I'm going to do? I, I'm, I'm going to offer them in obedience. I'm going to mix them up in an act of worship and thanksgiving. And I'm gonna take this, this thing that I wanna hold on to, this thing that I don't know if I offer it, if I'm ever gonna see it again. And I'm gonna place it into the oven of obedience. And I really don't wanna let go of it, but if I hold on to it while it's in the oven, my hand's gonna burn off. Because at some point, once you've given it over to God, you need to get your hands off it. And not just your hands off it, your eyes too. Come on, how many of us do this? You got no patience. I'm waiting. My mama used to say, a watch pot never boils. A watched promise never comes to pass. If you truly trust God, you have to let it go. Somebody say, let it go. You gotta give it over to God. And some of you right now, you gotta give that career over to God. You gotta give that job over to God. You gotta give that child over to God. And you have to trust God, and you gotta take your hands off it and say, I I'm going to wait patiently while it's in the oven of obedience, and it's hot, and it's hard, and everything in me wants to grab it and pull it out prematurely. And what happens when you do this, when, when you step out before God is good and ready, you get an unfinished product. You get something that's kind of God and kind of you, and can I tell you, that can't be blessed by God. And I wanna challenge you, if whatever you have right now, whatever you're offering to the Lord, keep it in the oven of obedience. Trust that God is a good father, because this is the process he's gonna use to multiply and bless what you've brought him, but you've got to trust him. Come on, some of us, we're good. Like, I don't know why I do this. When I put something in the microwave, I'll put it in there for 60 seconds. I'll open it right at the first, the last second, like before it hits. It's supposed to be in there for 60 seconds. Keep it in there. And you and I, we do that. We get things out of there quickly. Why? Because we just can't wait. Can I just tell you, Delayed obedience is still disobedience. 
even if it's 99.999%, that point one invalidates it. Why? Because that's not what God said. So I can imagine the anxiety in this woman as she's waiting at the oven, wondering if she's ever going to see this again, if this is gonna be the last meal, if she's just being duped, if this guy is just some, some snake oil salesman and he's just trying to get her money. That's what the church does. It's just trying to get our money. But when you give what you have to God, he gives you a guarantee. Look at what the prophet says in verse 14. He says, this is what the Lord of God says. Now, he's given her instruction, and he's given her promise, but now he says, here's your prophetic word. The jar of flour will not be used up, and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain back on the land. He says, until God fix this problem nationwide, he's gonna provide for you personally. And the Flour will not run out, and the oil will not run dry. It's just gonna keep replenishing. Every time you pour it out, it's gonna be replenished. Every time you scoop it out, it's gonna be replenished. And look at what it says, verse 15. She went away and did as Elijah told her. She put it in obedience, and, and she trusted God, and then it says, so there was food every day for who? Is it not up there? All right, I'll read it to you. They didn't want to help you today. So there was food every day for Elijah and the woman and her family. You see, God wasn't just intending on blessing her. He also needed to provide for his prophet. And see, when God blesses you, he doesn't just bless you to bless you. He blesses you to be a blessing to his house. And so what I want you to see here, verse 16, it says, the jar of flour was not used up, the jug of oil did not run dry, in keeping with the word that Elijah had spoken. But what was the blessing? The blessing was not more bread. She didn't get more bread. What did she get? More ingredients. How did she know she got more ingredients? She didn't know until she gave. Man, that's so good. I wish you got that like I got that this week. All right, God, I'm ready for you to bless me. Multiply it. Okay, it's not gonna multiply until you draw some out and give it away. And some of us, we want God to bless us by just magically putting it in our bank account. I mean, that'd be great, right? And sometimes, hey, he does some crazy stuff. But, but most of the time, it's not bread multiplied. It's not more money in your bank account. It's that he provides as you walk in obedience and give. The Bible says you've been blessed to be generous on every occasion. He's not gonna bless you so you can hoard it all to yourself and live a fit and famous life. No, no, he's blessed you so you can be a blessing to the world, a light in dark places and say, I'm going to make advances for the kingdom of God. That's why God blesses us. And maybe the reason why you're not seeing any miracles in your life right now is because you're not making room for them. You haven't seen that savings account increase because you haven't given anything away. You haven't seen God do a miracle in your marriage because you haven't laid down your life to serve in such a way where God would have to fill up what you've served. The miracle happens in the middle. It's in in motion. And here's the promise. Here's the main point that I want you to get from today's message, and the worship team can come back up. If you stretch your faith, God will supply a feast. You thought you were just gonna get a meal for a day and die. God says, no, 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 I'm gonna take you from glory to glory to glory. I'm gonna keep you for generations. This story with this woman lasts the entire chapter and even more. Why? Because God's hand is now upon her life. It's no longer about the bread now, It's about destiny, it's about calling. And I want you to know that if you're willing to stretch your faith, God will supply a feast in your life. The promise from scripture in Luke chapter six, verse 38, this is Jesus's words. Come on, if Jesus says it, you should believe it. He says, give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. It will be poured into your lap for the measure you use will be measured back to you. Whatever you bring to God, he's gonna bless it. 
And listen, it's a stretch. Somebody say, it's a stretch. It's a stretch. But when you stretch, God shows up. You know, as we've been talking about this and praying into this over the past few weeks, I wanted to make sure that as a church, we don't just ask you to do something, but that we lead by example. As the house of God, I believe we have a responsibility to not only teach you the ways of God, but to model the ways of God. And obviously, this is something that Trin and I, we, we've done year-end offering our, you know, our entire time here at E2 Church, seven years. We've given a lot over the past few years because we believe in this ministry. But it's not just us. We, we believe this church is supposed to stand as an example for you of what generosity looks like. And we always have. Did you know you're a part of an extremely generous church? Just this week, we were at Elk Grove Food Bank serving our community, packing meals together. Today, after the worship experience, we have an opportunity for you to pack Thanksgiving meals for families in need in our Elk Grove School District right here. We are partnered with dozens of outreach partners and organizations here in the city, Convoy of Hope, uh, globally. I mean, we give 12% of every dollar. We've done this from the beginning of our church. We wanted to set it as a financial policy that every dollar that's donated to E2 Church, 12% of that would be reserved, not for operations, not for payroll, not for building, for the community itself, for outreach alone, 12% of every dollar goes directly back into our community, the city of Elk Grove, the city of Sacramento, and the world abroad, because we believe that we are not just a church for the church people, but we're a church for people who will never walk in these doors, to care for the widow, to serve the orphan, to love on the homeless, to take care of the needy. And we've done that. We've given hundreds of thousands of dollars in the past seven years in outreach donations because of that 12%. You have done that. You have given that money to our community. But I feel like it's time to stretch. I feel like we're growing. God has blessed us as a church. And we've seen more growth than ever before in this past year. And if God has blessed us, he has not just blessed us for ourselves. He has blessed us to continue to be a blessing. And so we've been sharing with you these faith goals of things that we're gonna do here at E2 Church in 2025, but probably the most exciting faith goal for me is the one that I wanna to announce to you right now, that in 2025, we are officially changing our financial policy and moving from 12% of every dollar to 15% of every dollar. We are going to continue to be more and more generous in our city, to love on people who need it. I'm telling you, now, that may not seem like a big number, but when you see what that actually means, it's a big number. But I'm telling you, we believe not only are we capable of doing it, we have a responsibility to do this. And God has been so good to us. How could we not be a blessing to our community, to our city? And so now it's our turn. It's your turn to stretch your faith. On your way in, you received on your seat one of these little envelopes. I want to explain a little bit of what this is and how to participate in these next few moments. Inside are a few pieces of information, and then there's something called the giving card. This giving card is what we're asking for you to fill out today of what you're planning on giving or giving right now as your year-end offering. You can either give it cash in this envelope, or you can scan the QR code to give online and give that way. But as you write out that envelope and you seal it, what we're asking you to do on the front of this card is to write the word that God has spoken over your life for 2025. My word is devoted. The word for our church is make the climb. As you can see, we've got these really cool words on the walls here today. And I wonder what your word is. This is your seed of faith that you're sowing and believing that God will fulfill it in this next year. Now. I wanna make some things clear. If you are a first time guest with us or you're visiting our church, you are not obligated in any way to give. This is for our church family. Um, this is something that we do as a ministry every year. We bring a year end offering to God. But if you are a part of this church and you call E2 Church your home, I would really ask you to consider giving something today. And it may not be a year end offering. It may be, you know what? I'm gonna to commit to put God first in my finances and I'm gonna tithe in 2025. And that may not even be that 10%. It may be 2%. Whatever it is, stretch your faith today. Because when you stretch your faith, God will supply it. Now, 
Can I be honest with you? Can I just get real vulnerable for a second? This week, I struggled to stretch. We've been doing this for seven years and God's been so faithful to us and he's provided and yet we still have some things that we're walking through right now, financial challenges and some big things that are coming up and and then I looked at the $1.2 million that we got to raise for the building. And, and then I thought about all the pressure that I'm under as a pastor to get up here and try to get you to give. And it's not an easy job. I, this is the part of the job I don't enjoy. And I really struggled in my stretching this week because I felt a little disillusioned, discouraged. Like, is what I'm doing going to even make a dent? Does it even matter? Do I even really want to do this? And maybe you felt that this week. And as I felt that, I just got before the Lord in prayer. And as I spent some time with Jesus, he began to open my eyes to see what I was focusing on. See, I was looking at the ingredients in my life. I was looking at the need of our church. I was looking at the building campaign. I was looking at the pressure. I was looking at the responsibilities. And and because my eyes were focused on this, I was so focused on what I didn't have that I was missing out on what I do have. And in that moment of worship, I felt like God took these things out of my hands. And he said, it's not about the amount and it's not about the stretch. I want you just to look into my eyes. And as I began to look at Jesus, everything else became so less important. <laughs> You see, instead of giving to a building campaign or giving to a church or giving for a miracle that we're believing for our future, I put those things aside and now I just decided to give my gift to Jesus. You know why? Because he's been so good to us. He's been so faithful to our family. He's been so good to our church and our ministry. And, and when I look at him, the stretch is easy because it's not a stretch and it's not a sacrifice. And what I felt so strongly here today was I wanted to encourage you not to give out of obligation, not to give to a building, not to give to a ministry, but to give to Jesus.